I I chant roughly two thousand minutes a week. Wow, seven days a week for twelve years now. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but usually it's an average of about two thousand minutes a week. And over the years, I've tried to stop, and every time I do whatever else I'm doing, stop. So this is my service and my purpose for being here. For what they're holding down, I will get pictures of the room. I will even get the smells associated with those memories. Um, sometimes I I helped somebody, and all of a sudden, I saw the the whole living room, the ugly couch that was there, the lamps, all the people in the room, and it turns out that the person was being used in a ritual. So. I had to experience. You could smell the burning of the candles and the whole, all, all of it in the room, because the memory was that that buried inside their body. I want to welcome everybody back to another episode of the Soul Inspired. Today we have Emmanuel, a uh, Reverend Emmanuel, on with us today. He's a, he's a sound healer and works with a company called Divine Harmonics. So we're going to talk to him about the work that he does, a little bit about himself, but thank you so much, Emmanuel, for being here on the show today. I appreciate it. You're welcome, and thank you for having me. I know you've been doing a lot of work around sound healing. I want to back up a little bit before we get into what that is and how you got into it. And I wanted to ask you, when in your life, you felt there was something more you wanted to do from a, I would call what the work you do a spiritual type work. So I don't know. We can talk about what, it, how you see it, but who you were before that, like when did that shift happen and what kind of upbringing or lifestyle, who was Emmanuel growing up? I've actually done what I do my whole life. Um, I grew up in a very dysfunctional, um, emotionally abusive household. So I was in the streets a lot. My family had a ranch. Um, so during the summers, I would spend my time on the ranch. And I would go around fixing all the sick animals. And um, I wasn't allowed to play with children. So in order to have company, I would go take away pain from old people. And they would tell me about their lives. So it was um, always out in the streets. So I had no parental guidance. So you were you were kind of raising yourself? Pretty much, yes. Yeah. And did that go up into your adulthood and your twenties? And did it did it make it worse? Did you kind of get into any issues in your early because I'm 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 thinking back to when I was sixteen or seventeen and I was a lost I was lost at that time myself. And I had to make some really hard decisions to make sure I didn't go down a bad path. Did that come up in your life? I I started working when I was 10 and didn't really have any trouble until I became an adult. And then I did a lot of things that I should not have done. Um, spent a little bit of time in jail and um, about 12 years trying to destroy myself, trying, you know, because I didn't really like the difference is that um, I embody. I've never, ever, I've been different from everybody my whole life. So um, I'm an extremely sensitive empath. So one of the lessons I learned is that when you associate with certain types of people, because I'm so sensitive, I end up absorbing their energy and acting out their characteristics. Wow. So, Sorry, I'm, one, I'm making that when, face because... I'm I'm the exact same. Like you just said, you just basically spoke. That, I've never had someone say it the way you just said it. You take well, on the energy and act it out. That's exactly the way I was too, or am. A, a lot of sensitive empaths do that. So for me, it was a journey of discovering my own integrity and what was right for me and my behaviors and separating myself from the people I associated with. And gradually over time, I learned to find people that were in integrity that I could associate with and, and step away from the people that were um, sociopaths and other things so that I, I could shed those behaviors. Okay. So one of the first steps that you took was changing the people around you. Correct. Um, 
most people don't realize that when they're really sensitive, um, if they're caretakers and they they want it, they're always helping people. They're giving their energy away and replacing it with the negative energy from the other people, so that the other people can feel better and they can take on that responsibility. That habit tends to lead to different kinds of illnesses. So everything we do is an expression of energy, either inward or outward, and how we hold it. So, um, for instance, I've helped a lot of people get through different illnesses because they didn't know how to say no. And every time they say yes, there's a little knot that gets shoved into the stomach, and eventually that knot turns into bigger knots and blocks the energy and develops illness. So I teach people how to deal with their empathy and how to breathe and you know change their diet so that they don't hold stuff in their body anymore and um, allow them to express the emotions that they've packaged and, and locked into their body using sound. So the sound works like a tuning fork. It breaks up the... Um, emotions that you're holding into your body and then i help process through whatever information comes up or emotions um, detoxes can be anywhere from cramping to severe fevers um, emotional outbursts memories um, if you've held a memory down tight enough the smells associated with that memory will permeate the room so i pretty much live in a twilight zone yeah. where right i experience yeah. a lot of things <clears throat> wow so okay this is you're definitely speaking my language everything you're saying again is it makes sense to me because different at different times in my life when i've had different stressors or uh things i wasn't really reflecting on or taking care of it would it would turn into i, I don't i wouldn't say illness but i would get you know pain type things that would come up you know, pain in my body. And then I'd have to kind of work through that pain and eventually have to discover, is this real? And then almost talk to my pain and all kinds of weird things. So like the, the way that you're describing it, how you use sound is even more fascinating because I've never used that. And I'm a musician, but then I think to myself when I'm writing music, it's always been a healer for me and I'm using my own voice. So maybe there's something attributed to that. Well, in early cultures, um, a lot of indigenous people would talk to the body when it was out of sync, or they would sing to them in order to bring that harmony back into the body. The aborigines, when somebody broke a bone, they would the whole community would gather around that person and talk to the bone and get it, encourage it to heal, and it would heal within a matter of days. Wow! So, and there's a lot of in Egypt, they had, they built a lot of those chambers for healing with sound. So if you go into some of those chambers, the resonance, you can whisper and it'll send vibrations through the entire room. So sound has been used for levitation and a lot of things throughout history. We've just lost that ability to stay connected. Do you and think that that happened because of, because of science coming more in the forefront and, and, you know, medicine and those types of things that kind of got away from the natural ways of doing things in, the, in our past? Well, up until this, this century, sound has always been used to control the population. Music was always government sanctioned and controlled because they wanted that vibration to stay at a certain area and a certain frequency. So, with the advent of radio and, and the freedom of people to express, they no longer had that ability to, to maintain the kind of control that was used through sound. Wow. So instead, they changed the dynamic of the frequencies that we record with and turned them into an unnatural frequency. That said, I, I have never in my life purchased music because it's not, the frequency isn't conducive to the way I receive. It's, mm. It lowers your, your vibration. So I don't purchase music because of that. Okay. And I want to dig into that for a moment. That's really interesting that you don't purchase music because I, 
when I was young and I was getting into music, I knew it was a natural thing for me. I started writing as young as 11 years old. I was writing very serious things. I didn't know where it was coming from. It was very natural. So I would just start playing some chords and I'd just start singing words. The words would come out as gibberish. This is how I still write. They would come oh. out borderline gibberish, but the words would be trying to form because it was happening so quickly, like a freestyle. And then yeah. I would listen back and I'd say, okay, I knew what I was feeling. I knew what I was trying to say. And I would just write that in. I would write that in, write that in. And then I'd have the song. And as I got into my late teens and I started really thinking about getting in the industry, noticing the difference between the songs that I was writing and what I was saying and the way the song even sounded as opposed to mainstream, they didn't, they didn't fit. So I knew that the only way I was going to actually be noticed or get a record, you know, get a record deal or any of that kind of stuff was to go with what everyone is doing. It's it's the only way it was going to happen. And I, I refused to do it. And I just kept doing it my own way. And this is where I am today. Even to this day, I've done four albums, but I would, I've always said that my music is a little bit different. Maybe my last album was the closest to me trying to hit mainstream a little bit, trying, trying something different. Um, because as a musician, you, you want to get your music noticed and, but the most natural form of my writing has always been that form where I'm not thinking about anything else, but just allowing it to come through me. So going back to what you said about, you know, not purchasing music, if we're talking the general mainstream type of music, I can see why, because some of it's coming from a, from the wrong place. It's not. It's not coming from, it's not so, as much of a soulful place as it could be. No, they don't do that anymore. There's very few singers that sing from the soul anymore. Yeah. Um, in fact, there's not really a lot of singers out there today that if you took away all the electronic stuff, they could actually sing. Right. right. So That's right. Yeah. I, I've been in and out of the industry off and on for many years. I've worked with a lot of very talented singers. Um, but I've always stayed on the peripheral. I never wanted to get pulled into the Mishigas that comes with it. When did you discover that you wanted to use your voice for healing? Because you said you were going through those troubled times in your years in and out of prison, those types of things, and finding yourself, figuring out that you don't want to be around people that brought your energy down. When did you start bringing that higher energy in and deciding you wanted to work with sound? Well, I, like I said, I've done it off and on my whole life. Um, God actually pushed me to do this. I I lost a lot of money, and I did day labor for a while to pay my bills and feed my family. And I hurt myself, and I went out and I prayed and I asked for help because I had to feed my family. And the next day, I got a phone call from a gentleman I had helped 10 years prior with cancer. He said to me, I got two friends with cancer. Will you help? I told him absolutely, and then I went out my cuss God for two hours. I was so angry. I have to feel everything everybody goes through. So yeah. it's some days it's just like a pincushion. I end up with, you know, at the end of the day, beat up because I've dealt with so many people's trauma. Wow. And so, um, and over the years, I've tried to stop, and every time I do whatever else I'm doing, stops. So. This is my service and my purpose for being here. And I've done it for the last 14 years very quietly and through referral only. And I'm at a place now where it's time to open up and help more people. So um, hence, I'm here on your podcast. Well, we do appreciate you being on here. The more you talk, I'm realizing, you know, I inter introduced or introduced you as a sound healer. Um the word medicine man comes more to my, my, <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever said that about you, but that's kind of more what I'm feeling. I get um, called a lot of things. It's just, I, I don't really fit in a box. Mm -hmm. So I do counseling. I use herbs. I do a lot of different things depending on what the person needs, but mostly uh, um, it's teaching people how to deal with their empathy and live in their integrity, whatever that is for them. Mm hmm and for everybody else, it's different. One of the earliest lessons I learned was to look at people for who they were and know that that was their character and either accept them in my life or not, but not to judge them for it. So if somebody's a thief, 
you can't be surprised if they're in your house and they steal from you because you knew they were a thief. So I had friends that were thieves and I would buy certain things I wanted to give them and I would leave them around the house when they visited. If it disappeared, I would be happy because I knew they got the gift I wanted to give them. And they didn't steal what I didn't want them to steal. And when they no longer served a purpose in my life, I separated myself from that relationship. But mm. you have to look at people for who they are and accept that. Well, in society, we're taught to create denials for them and pretend that they're not that person. Mm -hmm. And then we go along, and six months later, when they act according to who they are, we get shocked and surprised. They, why'd they do that to me? Right. right. Well, you knew. You just didn't want right. to acknowledge who they were. Yeah. The same in relationships and you know yeah. every other aspect of life. You got to be honest with what's in front of you. It's really difficult to release those relationships, especially if they meant something to you at some point in your life. Because we get conditioned into holding on to the thing that they provide for us. We keep relationships in our life to either hold us where we are or to propel us forward. And most of our relationships keep us in the, in the place that we're at. They mm -hmm. give us the ample support, whether it's positive or ne negative. And, you know, every genre every aspect of life carries a frequency just like a biker if you see a uh, hell's angel scooter tramp you happen to go across the world most likely you'll see the same scooter tramp just a different face because they live in that frequency and when you rise above those frequencies those kind of people tend to disappear in you have very little interactions in your life because you're have raised yourself above that. And that goes with any um, grouping of people or um, ideology. We're yeah. all attracted to that frequency. And in order to free yourself from that, you need to raise your vibration and your perspectives, which, you know, we all get caught into just being in the moment and writing along with the stories instead of grounding ourselves and looking at where, where the truth is. So the, so the groupings of people around there's, they carry an energy and they do. I, so do I places. Was, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was thinking uh, what came to me is my first, one of the first things I want to do in my life is I wanted to, I wanted to help ever after I kind of felt like I kind of overcame some of my anxieties and stuff as a kid. And I got in trouble with wrong people at different times and stuff. And I thought, I want to help people now. So I thought, oh, I'll become a social worker. And so I started working in social work environments. We're talking missions, like men's missions, like homeless shelters. We're talking about kids' homes that were abused and all kinds of the worst things they could go through. And I started doing this and I'd go home and I would just melt every night. My energy, I was just so like sick from being around it. it. It's not like I loved the people I was trying to so much. And so I can relate to why, how you, if you're dealing with people who are ill, you're probably taking on a lot of energy. And I guess where I'm, I eventually had to get out of social work because I just couldn't do it as much as I tried to be that person. It didn't fit. I, I thought I'm going to fall apart. I could see myself falling apart if I continued. So how did you learn to not embody the energy of those you're working with? How do you, like, I'm just trying to think if people are out there, if they can get anything that can help them not take The reason you got ill was because you were trying to take responsibility for that. Okay. So I don't take responsibility for anybody. That's between you and God. I don't heal anybody. That's between you and God. All I do is I hold space. I allow the energy to pass through me. I don't hold on to it because, again, it's not my responsibility. And I still have to detox. I burn up with a fever every night for half an hour to an hour and burn off the, you know, the excess energy that I didn't shed. Um, if somebody's on chemo, um, I tend to throw up bile and mucus and process through. You can smell it coming through my skin, the chemo, and they don't end up normally having to process it. So everything, again, is energy. So when you're, and this is one of the biggest things that makes people sick that don't know how to say no, they tend to want to take responsibility for that person, like rescuers. They're, 
they take responsibility for that person. So they end up carrying all of that angst and, and despair and everything else while the person that they've taken it from gets a moment of respite and, you know, feels better for a little while. But they didn't fix the pattern, so they're going to go through it again. And the person who did the rescuing is going to have to repeat it again and take, you know, lose more, more energy to that nonsense. Wow. Okay. So it, it really is. Um, I broke my give off very young. Yeah, <laughs> nice. I like how you, <laughs> I like how you said to not take responsibility for them and that you hold a place for them and God. You're just you're holding a space for for them. Right. Correct. You, Without judgment. Right. And then when you when you go away from it and you have these emotional reactions or even physical reactions, you uh recognize that it was from the and you release it. You release Correct. it. Okay. Um, a large wow. part of what allows us to hold on to stuff is our judgments. When we start perceiving something as what it could or how it should be, instead of again just observing where it's at and allowing the energy to flow those judgments are a way for us to hold on to things we're internalizing those judgments mm. whereas if you can just look at something and observe it and kind of hold space and have compassion for it it'll process through in their own experience without you having to take that energy yeah, I mean, because as a, I'm a music coach and everything, I deal with a lot of people, right? And I'm even dealing with people when I interview them on the podcast. Like I'm always around yeah. different different individuals all the time, so I do know as an empath too, I can feel energy. I've always felt that, and I've been told to learn to not take it on because it it that never ends well, you know. So, um, it you're saying some very important things for and a lot of the people, a lot of the audience that join the Soul Inspired are a lot of empaths, a lot of people who are interest in this work because they can feel it you know there's a there's this right. feel it they know it so so you're saying to not allow to not to, to hold a space for people but to not take responsibility for what they've gone through and to have that boundary and that's Correct. important and is that does that is that what would so i know you deal with people who've are, who are already fallen ill and you're you're helping healing them or helping them get better are those the things people should be doing to prevent because i'm really big on prevention like are those are the things that we do if is that kind of what gets us down that road of illness over time? It is. It is. So yeah. the important thing is to breathe. Most people, they only breathe to the top of their chest because they're holding stuff down. The shallower somebody breathes, the more stuff they're holding down in their body that they don't want to feel. Mm -hmm. So breathing is very important. The next thing is to allow yourself to be present in your body to feel. When you eat something, if it's not right for you, your body will immediately tell you in some way. It'll either go into convulsions, it'll tighten up, it'll push back, it'll. But we eat it anyway because we're we're unconscious to what's happening with our body. Mm -hmm. When um, I'm an extremely sensitive empath, so if I go into a bar, I don't drink. If there's more than ten people drinking in half an hour, I'm staggering and slurring. Wow. For all intents and purposes, I've even been if there's hard alcohol having to throw up and sober up when i leave the place because there was just too much so one of the things i do with certain clients is i have them come visit me and i take them on field trips we go to either walmart or costco on a you know saturday morning because it's the, one of the most toxic places you can walk into <laughs> okay. and it allows me yeah. to see how they're processing the energy when they're in public um everybody's different i helped a gentleman who was suicidal um, he was raised in the baha'i religion i took him to walmart and we weren't there 20 minutes when i realized he was taking people's energy but he was targeting people that were very ill and somehow he was separating the sick energy from their healthy energy well the healthy energy had all the despair in it so he would go home and he would start to act out all these reasons why life was so bad and he had to himself none of it was his wow so once i taught him what he was doing and how to separate himself he hasn't been suicidal in two years now and that's fascinating because every time my girlfriend and i go into a walmart and she's an empath too we're very mm -hmm. sensitive we found each other that way and and a musician 
and we go in and we leave and we're just agitated. Like we're like, oh. like it's just well, like the Walmart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're just like, what is going on? Why, why? I don't know why Walmart, but it's, it's just an so extremely low vibration business. It attracts the lowest vibration of our society. And they all go there with all of their issues and their problems, and it just permeates the place. Yeah. So people who can really feel energy get really affected. I mean, I get in that parking lot. Right. I just want, I'm just ready to run. And it's, it's, uh, so how can so, somebody, so what can someone do? What's it, what's an exercise people can do when they go have, into Walmart and, and they grounded. Or say grounded, sorry. You have to stay grounded. So I wear moccasins, weather permitting. If, the, if it's raining out, I wear Crocs because I can throw them off and put my feet in the ground. But rubber sole shoes keep you from being grounded. It's impossible to be grounded if you're wearing rubber sole shoes. So I wear moccasins so that I can stay, you know, keep my feet into the earth. If I don't have the opportunity to do that, I keep a piece of jade in my pocket so that I can ground into the jade if I need to. Mm. But one of the things that happens, like, have you ever had an issue with somebody and all of a sudden it feels like the energy swirling around the top of your head? Yes. Well, yeah. in those moments, it's because the energy is swirling and neither party is grounded and nothing, nothing is going to be resolved while that energy is swirling because it's all chaos. There's no, no groundedness. Nobody's present. You're all caught up into the emotions and the drama of whatever is transpiring. So when you start to feel that swirling, it's best just to disconnect and walk, walk away, get grounded, then come back and you know deal, deal with the issue from a calm and centered place. Mm -hmm. So it's just little things that happen on a regular basis that we don't pay attention to, but we all feel it, whether it's intensely or, or minutely, we still feel those things. Just nobody taught us that we're empathic and how to deal with it. Right. I, I've gotten a lot of people off of anxiety medications by teaching them how to deal with their their empathy because a lot of that anxiety, it's the energy field you're in that you're processing. It's It has nothing to do with you. So once people learn to separate themselves from the energy, I, I do a, a, an exercise every day of my life when I wake up. I go through it. It's a breathing exercise. I relax my body. I tell it, you know, to let go. And when I'm done, I sit with myself and I take inventory to how my body feels. So when I go into the world and I start to get different aches and pains, I can go back to that memory of where I started mm -hmm. and separate myself from everyone else's energy. So it's, 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 it kind of brings you back to awareness because it's you're, all it's about awareness. It's 100%. Awareness. Yeah. Yes. And the whole world is really fixated on distracting. So we're, we're being distracted from our own awareness. I had doing the, so with the soul inspired, it really is turned into a, a I, I, I'd say 90% of my, the people, the guests I have, have had near death experiences and they've had, uh, you know, left their body, had energy, seen their energy, seen their soul, had all these afterlife experiences come back. And as amazing as all that is, I am listening to some of the trauma they go through until they get to that near death experience, right? And some of that trauma is horrific. Some of it is not. A lot of it is. Yeah. It's not. It's not uh, for the faint of heart. And what would happen is when I first started the the show, afterwards I would be shaking. Um, I I'd be going upstairs and I'd sit there and my my girlfriend would be like, "Are you okay?" I'm like, "I just need a second. Or I'd be emotional. Or I'd be. Um, and I started asking some of the intuitives that I was interviewing, what should I do? And they said, you need to be grounded, go outside, put your feet on the, in the ground. And I did this a few times and I was shocked. I felt immediately better. I don't know why that brought me back, uh, but I wasn't doing that up until that point. And well, so you yeah. got grounded and you, you centered into your own body and separated their energy from yours. So I helped a, a woman a couple of years ago. She had Bell's palsy. And she did reverse mortgages for her living. So the first thing I did was tell her to quit her job. Okay. Because it was the job that made her sick. Wow. And it wasn't necessarily the job. It was she was doing reverse mortgages. 
So I tried to explain to her, um, and, and she wasn't understanding. So at one point, I had her on the phone and I started talking about my childhood, which was pretty horrendous. About 20 minutes into the conversation, I stopped and asked her, what the hell she's doing on my lap? She says, what are you talking about? Now, mind you, we're on the phone. I said, you're sitting there with your legs up, got a bucket of popcorn, and you're just sitting here enjoying the show. You have embodied every ounce of what I'm going through. This is why you got the Bell's palsy, because those old people come, they start kvetching about their life and all the problems, and you get sucked right in and then get a part of popcorn and own everything. Wow. So after 20 years of owning everybody's <laughs> kvetching, her face couldn't take it anymore. Right. Right. She no longer has her, her she, she's healed mm -hmm. back to normal, but it was six months of really getting her to see how her job made her sick and the way she was taking and owning, you know, all of that energy from those people. Yeah. And a lot of people do this unconsciously without realizing what they're doing because we're not taught how to deal with energy and, you know, it's ebb and flow. Energy is constantly moving unless we're holding it down and shoving it down so that we don't have to feel. And I truly believe that if we all allowed ourselves to feel, this would be a completely different world. You know, yeah. I learned very young when I treated somebody badly, I didn't like the way it felt. So I stopped treating people that way. Mm -hmm. And it also goes to, you know, the quality of life. When you treat people badly all the time, there's always a lot of issues in your life you have to deal with. If you teach people, treat people with respect and kindness and generosity life is golden there yeah. are no hindrances in life but you know that's again the balance of energy and how we emit it and how we receive it mm -hmm. a lot of people um, don't receive the things they want in their life because they end up in a place where they resist it because they don't know how to receive all energy, how we hold it, our mental you know, capacity to hold certain emotions and draw energies to us. Um, and when we let it go, the freedom, that's like, um, have you ever noticed toddlers, they always get what they want and life is always golden? Right. It's because they know it's theirs and there's no impossibilities. Right. I have a two-year-old right now, so I know I know how that feels. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And People with Down syndrome, their life is always golden. It's always provided for. Well, they don't have any negative thoughts. They're always happy. They're always positive. Life is always wonderful. They're always in that perpetual, everything is possible. They're always open to receive someone to take care of them. And there's always someone to take care of those people mm -hmm. or give them guidance or support them on their own. But they don't have bad lives as a majority in a whole. That's amazing. And you, it's it's interesting how you mentioned the Bell's palsy because it feels like people have these things happen in their lives and there's just different diseases that manifest or take form, right? It's It's weird how everyone has different ways that it comes out of the body. But I would assume with the work that you've done that a lot of the times when you're working with people, it's all kind of the same, right? It's It just manifests itself in different ways. Is that the way you would look at it? Pretty much. Yeah, it, it really, again, it depends on how you hold your energy, where your beliefs are, your shortcomings. Um, most diseases are manifest as a way of our body trying to tell us, hey, something's wrong, you're out of balance. Right. And we need to fix that. 90% of, of the people that I've helped have all been emotional in how they hold their energy. Mm -hmm. The other 10% has been genetics or their their environment or some other thing that made them ill. But most of the people that I've helped, it's all, all emotional in how they hold their energy. And so one of the th things people can start doing is grounding themselves better and realizing that the energy around them is they're not responsible to hold on to that if it's not theirs. So. No. 
And, and one of the most important things you can do, the healthiest things you can do, is go play. Play? Play is the most healing thing people can do because it yeah. lets all the stress go. It gets them out of their head. And it allows the body to rejuvenate. Your body will heal itself and rejuvenate and, and replace all the bad things if there's no stress. Right. And and you're happy and you're honoring it and taking care of it. I, I had a, a friend. She went and had, she had inverticulitis. And they had to have part of her colon removed. Well, she came home and the first thing she did was get a bag of Doritos and some Twinkies and, you know, started putting it all back in there again. Right, right. So, you know, you can't eat that kind of poison if you want to stay, keep your body healthy. So diet, yeah. you, you see diet as a big piece of, of healing Diet's as well. Diet's a tremendous, um, it, it's one of the ways that we use to numb ourselves is junk food. When I don't want to feel anything, I go get a bag of caramels mm. or I'll go eat a pastrami and, you know, be screwed up for a couple of days. Right. So we use food as a way to suppress our feelings or hold down the stuff that we're already holding down. So again, when you eat something, your body will tell you if it's vital and it you know gives it energy or if it's lethargic and shutting it down and numbing it. We just you got to pay attention when you eat something. Mm. When you go someplace, do you feel good or are you all of a sudden feeling tight and condensed and shut down? It's not a healthy place for you. So, but we immerse ourselves and we create excuses. We get tums, whatever it is, we you know to numb ourselves so that we don't have to feel it. Right. Most people I've learned, you know, it's hard. Most people don't want to heal. They just want somebody to make them feel better. Healing takes work and effort and, you know, being present in your heart. So a lot of people aren't really ready to, to feel that deeply mm -hmm. well i've always been really big on whole foods eating things naturally at its most natural source and not processed as much and i find if i go off that and i start eating all the processed stuff i i tend to have more issues come up so i relate to and because i'm sensitive already to everything i've had to do that you know it affects me it affects my skin affects different things i've had to deal with so I can relate to that. And it's maybe because it doesn't put so much pressure on the body. It, it's the pressure on the body. Um, it also has an effect on your energy field. My, my children, I have a two, two year old, an eight year old and a 12 year old. They've been sick once. That was with COVID. They were over it two days with no medicine. I don't have a television in my house. All of the, food that they eat is homemade they've never had any fast food or processed food wow. they don't get sick there's no illness in this house wow and that's a big so, piece to take you know i mean a lot of people don't want to hear that but it's just the truth if you're if you're feeding your body this vehicle that we have for only a certain amount of time you gotta you gotta feed it correctly so Wow. So you, so you know all about the energy you've been working with this. When did the voice stuff happening and how do you use your voice in order to heal others? So the voices I've heard my whole life, they, they just have always been there. And it's, I've realized I hear again, it's energy mm -hmm. people, what they're thinking what's out in the you know ethers in the energy field so if it's like when we're in town if there's a lot of fear whatever that focus of the fear those thoughts will start to permeate and overwhelm so i had to learn how to separate myself from the voices that aren't mine okay. and it, it's if you've ever watched charlie brown mm -hmm. the teacher so it gets to be like that little white noise in the background um, so the, the healing part, again, I would take old people's pain away. So they would talk to me, my hands get really hot. Um, I would fix all the animals in the, in the yard, in the neighborhood actually. Um, so I've just always been this way. I'm, I'm pretty sure I learned it in the womb. My first memories are in the womb. My mother, 
um, had me very young and was abused a lot. So during one of those abusive sessions, I got hit in the head and kind of came present. And then mom would go to band practice because she was into musicians. And the sound is very different coming through the stomach and the fluids and everything. Mm. So what I do, I, I can get up to eight audible tones out of my voice at one time, which I'm told we're not supposed to be able to do. I have a lot of friends that are producers, so they um, aren't quite sure. So, And then a lot of times my lungs will work like a bellows where I'm breathing in. And as I'm breathing in, the sound will come out and I'll work the lungs so that I can get um, higher frequencies and still as I'm breathing in, the sound comes out. Wow. So not sure how I do that, but um, when I started to teach people, um, I learned how complicated what I do really is because I had to stop and say, oh, I do this too. And then I, oh, oh, when I do this and I realized by the time I was done with the end of the day, how truly complicated my body is working as I'm doing the chanting. Right. So, wow. Well, I mean, I, I, as a voice person myself, I'm listening to what you're saying and I can, I can visually understand what you mean about the eight tone, mm -hmm. like going through it. I did yeah. have a quick little look at, uh, um, the sound of your voice when you're doing these. And I, I was kind of mesmerized. Um, where did, where do people, where, how can people hear this? Like, do they just find that on social media or where, because I'm, um, I'm sure people are curious listening to what your voice would sound like in those. I have, music. I have a YouTube and I have an Instagram and a TikTok. Um, I do post small recordings of my voice um, on my SoundCloud. All of those recordings are healing sessions from clients. I take out the conversations and I put the chants up. Um, mm -hmm. Bandwidth, when I have the bandwidth to upload them. Right. So I do spurts when I upload client recordings. There's also a recording on there with my morning meditation that I do every day. Um, that's under Divine Harmonics on my SoundCloud. Okay, so Divine so, Harmonics is your social media handle across the board? Yes, okay. across the board. That's amazing. So you've done the chanting. You call it you call it chanting. So I want to bring this up for a moment because I coach musicians. And there are a few musicians I coach right now that are into uh, kirtan and chanting, but like a singing type of chanting. And yes. I wasn't introduced into this until I met these these folks and I was I was coaching them on their voice and getting their voices better. But uh, I started doing the work, too. I started chanting with them and doing the songs. And it's very repetitive. Right. And you're speaking yeah. uh, Sanskrit. There's scans Sanskrit. And I had to learn how to actually mm -hmm. pronounce some of these words. And I, so in the beginning, it was just a learning process. And then when I got to this this place of now I can do this, started noticing something very, very peculiar and I, I wanted I wanted since I have you here I want to ask you so in my own music or in covers you know if I go play a show or do a private gig and I'm doing all these you know these regular songs I don't really get any kind of like I get I can I can become emotionally connected to a song if it's speaking a little bit to something that relates to me but I don't feel energetically any different um I have something very bizarre that starts to happen when I am doing the chanting. So I'll be doing the chanting and singing and I get very drowsy, very drowsy, very quickly, even from my own singing. So I'll be doing it. And I almost, I'm, this is the first I've ever mentioned it. And probably if my, if the, uh, if the clients I work with listen to this, they'll think it's funny because I've never mentioned this to them, but there's times where I'll be teaching and coaching and going through the song with them in a chant. And I actually feel like I'm almost sleeping. Like I feel like I'm actually asleep, but I'm still, do, my body is still doing the work. And then when I come out of it, I'm like, holy smokes. Why do you That's think that happens? You're starting to open up your pineal gland. Okay. When your pineal glands opens, that's the first thing that happens is you go into an utter state of relaxation and your awareness is highly acute. You should be able to feel 
go outside and feel the trees and the grass and everything, the vitality in it, if you maintain that space. So it's just, it's not just me getting tired because I, no, I mean, you're, there's you're no... You're actually working on opening, relaxing the body and opening the pineal gland. That's what Kirtan is supposed to be for, is to open the pineal gland. Okay. See, and in my own... I don't want to say my own ignorance, but I'm I'm doing the work with them because that's not my I didn't start I didn't that's not how I started my music journey, but it's being introduced and I'm just doing it and then having an effect from it and being an empath, I didn't understand what was happening. Why and I and then I come back at it, I'm like yawning and I'm like, I gotta oh, what is happening? It's like I'm overwhelmed with this this tired feeling. So most, most cure time players get brought into it for spiritual purposes but very few of them get educated on what the sound is actually doing right and purpose of it just like sound healing mm -hmm. i use the the box but i don't actually fit into what sound healing is sound healing with, with bowls and other things they heal through relaxation what i do focuses on raising your vibration and pushing you through your stuff so there it's not geared towards relaxation it's geared towards raising your vibration and forcing your body to remember itself right. so there's a slight there's a, a slight difference in the way the sound works wow have you had yourself had any type of spiritual type encounters or anything that's happened during any of these sessions that you've worked with people like can you do you ever see any energy or is it just are, are you in that I, zone at the time i see the energy um if the people's memories are strong enough for what they're holding down i will get pictures of the room i will even get the smells associated with those memories mm -hmm. um sometimes i i helped somebody and all of a sudden I saw the the whole living room, the ugly couch that was there, the lamps, all the people in the room. And it turns out that the person was being used in a ritual. So I had to experience, you could smell the burning of the candles and the whole, all, all of it in the room because the memory was that, wow. that buried inside their body. So your sense comes out in, in smell a lot. Smell, um, Smells very a uh, highly acute sense. Um, mm -hmm. I see things like fear. Fear has a, a very sweet smell to it. Mm. Um, anxiety has a sour smell to it. Though. So all of our emotions, again, that frequency will carry an odor, and that's what animals, you know, wolves and dogs, that's what they smell when they're in there. Is your frequencies. That's that's amazing. You, I wanted to ask you this. You look at the the way the world is, everything the way it is. Now it sounds like you keep yourself fairly secluded from the outside world, and for good purpose, for good reason. I look at the things that are happening. I look at the fact that the podcast I started came out of nowhere. I felt it. I felt a calling for it, and I just started doing it. And now I feel like I'm growing very quickly in a because I'm I'm around different types of individuals. Yes. And I feel like this is happening a lot right now. Do you do you feel like we're moving into some new place with this because I'm noticing more and more of it. I mean, it there's a lot of bad going on, but I'm seeing these changes happen it rapidly. It started a couple of years ago. The frequency of the planet is raising. Mama's trying to wake us up. So, a lot of people are starting to go at a higher consciousness is because their vibrations are naturally raising. Hmm. And again, the higher you allow your frequency to go, the more you relax, the easier it is to access knowledge and the things that are right for us. So all knowledge is available to us. We just have to surrender and open up and allow ourselves to receive it. That's yeah. why some people have brilliant dreams and brilliant ideas while they're sleeping because they're in a REM state that allows themselves to receive. And they were searching for a problem, you know, an answer to a solution so strongly that they were open to receive what was floating out into the ethers. So you believe that we are waking up because we can't keep going the route we're going. 
That's Correct. the way I feel too. I feel like there's no, there is no secondary option at this point because we're we've got in a hurry to, to take the earth out of its balance and destroy, destroy it and thus ourselves. So earth needs to be in balance. All life needs to be in balance. And we as human beings tend to like to take life out of balance and mm -hmm. contort it to our own purposes. Hence, mm -hmm. I wrote a poem about eight years ago discussing climate change and, and what we're doing and you know at the time the globe was on a four percent wobble it's now on a six percent wobble and when i wrote the poem i wrote about you know us not paying attention to what we're doing we're draining oil which is a natural insulator we're draining water which is a natural insulator our core is heated, so those oceans are melting from underneath because we're taking all the insulation out. But the biggest thing is we're in a sphere. You take any sphere and fill it with liquid and spin it, it'll spin true. Well, you start taking that liquid out, it's going to start to wobble. Mm. Our planet's wobbling. We've been taken out. And, and last year, they actually put a study out saying that the wobbling was contributed because of the water that we're taking out of the sea. They didn't mention the oil because nobody wants to go there, but they did acknowledge that the planet, planet is on a wobble because of the water that we're taking out and redistributing. I've never looked at it that way. I have no education around that at all. And it doesn't, that, that, that makes we perfect don't sense. Feel, but if you allow yourself to feel, you can feel the toxicity in the earth. Mm -hmm. She's not happy. But mm -hmm. again, we don't allow ourselves to feel. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same sense when I'm out in what we would call country out here, a countryside where it's all trees and nature and everything. I get an overwhelmed feeling of like happiness and love and I feel mm -hmm. so good. And then I come back in because I'm from a bigger, bigger city and I come back into the city. And I call it Cement City and I drive in and I immediately feel like a repelling, like a ugh, like a like this. I'm like, because it's not real. Like I look around I'm like none of this is real. And it it's doesn't. Topic. Yeah, it doesn't feel good. And, um, and a lot of us have done that. We, we created that. And I feel like I, I have this feeling, I don't know why I feel it, um, that we'll be going back the natural nature state over time. I don't know how that happens, but I feel it. I just see it. I like, I can't, I can't a... keep building skyscrapers of apartment buildings and we, we can't keep doing that. It doesn't. It no. Well, there's a big right. movement in permaculture to get people to understand to, to heal the earth and you know save our food supply. And there's also a lot of people going back into homesteading because you know they're tired of being poisoned. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a lot of people waking up to self sufficiency, and that dynamic is changing. But um, until life becomes more important than money. Nothing's ever going to change. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good. That's a very good point. Absolutely, but we are. I. I just. I'm. I've always been the optimist. I always feel like we're going to get there, but it's like we growing will. pains hurt. To. Growing pains hurt, and that's what I think we're all going through. We are, and right now we're because we're in such a big, huge shift. There's so many things coming to the surface, and we're seeing all the craziness that we've allowed to settle into our consciousness. And, you know, hopefully it gets to a point where we've all had enough and it shifts. Yeah. And that's what my hope is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You you, uh, you mentioned that you have things on SoundCloud, you have social media and these different chanting things that you do. If people are, if people listen to those, can that, can that help them raise their own vibration? Like, do they have to speak with you individually or can they actually, no, do you have any the, work the, out there they can just... I I have a, quite a few clients that I haven't seen in years that that's how they maintain themselves. Wow. They just go listen to the recording so they don't need to call me. So I work um, very differently than most healers. I want to get you well and out of my life as quickly as possible. Okay. Right. And I don't want to hear from you again. Right. So, yeah. Um, and if you take what I've taught you and you embody it, there should be no reason you get sick again. I don't get sick. So there's no um, Mr. Goss or BS in my life that I allow that'll take me out of my center. 
This has all been amazing. I've been a little bit uh, taken back by your story. If I'm being honest, I'm um, I understand energy is a big piece of this whole thing that I'm just learning and learning at my age and everything that we don't like, we don't look at, we, we tend to just look at our bodies and think that, okay, this is the body we're given. And this is just like what we have to deal with and the ailments we've got to deal with. We got to go run off and get this medication and do this. And again, Disclaimer, I'm not saying to people to stop taking their medications and things like that. But I think that I'm realizing that there's the human body, but there's the energy body. And I'm seeing this constantly in a lot of the people I talk to, especially these are people who've had these, you know. We have three bodies. We have three bodies. We have our emotional body. We have our energetic body. And we have our physical body. And they all work together. And when we separate one from the other, that's what allows illness. And in order to acknowledge all three bodies, you have to allow yourself to feel. Do you are you do you know how to feel your energy field? I don't. How would I feel my energy? A field? real simple exercise. It's a child's exercise. If you take your hands and you rub them together until they get warm, mm-hmm. separate them, and as you slowly push them together, you'll start to feel a small resistance. That resistance is your energy field. Some of them will go way out. Some of them go. The more you practice that, the more you'll get familiar with that. I think I remember this as a kid. I think I remember it. Yeah. Once you get used to feeling your energy field, when you're out in the world, it's a subtle, just a little, it feels like a little breath of wind when the energy shifts. You should be able to feel that same kind of feeling that you're feeling between your hands. It's that subtle when the energy shifts. That's why so much, of us, so much of us, we don't pay attention to it because they're very subtle shifts. Wow. And if you're not fully aware and present, you're not going to feel those shifts. Right. You're just going to follow through with wherever the vibration is in that place. But the goal is to have your emotional energy and physical body in alignment with Correct. one another. And that means living in your integrity, knowing what's right for you, what's not right for you, what you want out of your life. I mean, the vast majority of people don't even really know what they want in their life. Right. Yet we're on a perpetual thinking we're running a life, but it's not really what we want. It's what we think we're supposed to do or, you know, we have to be successful or whatever it is we convince ourselves to keep us out of our center. And, you know, even so, though we maintain that unconsciousness, some people just find one really good thing that they're good at and they make a lot of money with it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean they're intelligent or capable in any other area of their life. They're just really good in that area. So, um, yeah, I, I got watch people a lot most of my life and I wanted to know why. You know, as you watch patterns, there's certain things that are just consistent. Different phase, but the pattern's consistent. Right. That's probably why a lot of times when you have a negative type energy in your life and you push it away, sometimes that person will come back, a different person, but you can feel the same kind of energy. Like you, you're like, oh, it's back. So you didn't either, either you haven't learned the lesson or figured out how to work with that yet. And you have to kind of work at it a different way. You can't just let them go. Sometimes it's like, okay, because I've had that. I've, I've got, I've been, okay, good, good thing. They're out. And then the next thing it's like, wait a second, this different person, I feel the same energy though. Yeah. And when you learn the lesson, that energy doesn't come back anymore. Right. That's exactly it. So, you know, again, and that, that goes back to, we keep people in our lives to keep us where we are. And just like successful people will tell you, if you want to succeed, hang around with people that succeed. Mm-hmm. It's because you you need to be immersed in that kind of energy. Yeah. This speaks so true to me. I can I can't that that we keep people in our life. We keep people in our life to keep us where we are. I think a lot of people can relate to that. And what's interesting is I feel that as you shift that a bit, or you start to work with it, you start to be good to yourself and shift away from that. Other types of energies start to show up that make you feel better. And you go, oh, yes. there you are. 
my goodness, it was almost like they were there waiting, but you were so busy with this energy. They, it's not that they weren't there. You just shifted your awareness of these. And, and now, does that make sense? Am I saying this right? Yeah. I'm trying to explain it the and, right way. And That's if, how I see it. And if you become complacent and you stay in an area of comfortableness and the spirit wants you to grow, they'll send another opportunity to force you to grow. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly in a state of movement. And the whole goal is to, again, be centered in your heart and, you know, live in your integrity. And for everybody, that's different. So again, you need to honor who you are. If you're a thief, go be a thief and, and be okay with it. If you're a liar, know you're a liar. And, you know, that's just the way you're going to you know, be treated in the world. And so on and so forth. So once you own who you are, it gets really easy. Right. You know, just like certain people in our society, they own who they are so much that you can't tell that they're not lying anymore. Mm -hmm. And we all look up to them. Right. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. The emotional energy, the emotional body, the energy body and the physical body is really what's it's sticking with me. Because I no. believe there's so many times where we're uh, we're doing we're we got our physical body it's doing what it needs to do it's going to that job, but the emotional body is running away from the job. It's not present. It doesn't feel good. It feels terrible. Um, and then the energetic piece of it, I guess, is that spiritual play. It's the spirit body, right? It's the it's being grounded so how do you make i mean that's what i'm saying if you're if your physical is doing something that it's just meant to be it, it's just been told to do but the emotional body is running really how on earth do you think you can keep the the, the energy body in in check you can't i mean you right you, you have, have to, to so it's it's important to be grounded and to deal with that that emotional body i think i think that's a big piece of it Correct. right the emotional yeah. body is the biggest thing we use to make ourselves ill and to structure our outside experience. Yeah. So if you're in a lot of fear all the time, you're going to draw more, you know, more situations to support that fear. If you're happy all the time, you'll draw in situations to support that happiness. That's just how it works. Right. And, you know, if you start to get lost in your head and you, open up different avenues, then you're going to get surprises. And the one thing that I have learned, your eyes, your mind will lie every opportunity they get. Your body, if you learn to feel, will never, ever lie to you. But okay. we condition our mind to create excuses mm -hmm. and denials, especially like women are really well taught at this because they got to deal with idiots and make excuses for them all the time. Mm. So, um, and then after the fourth or fifth time, they realize, what am I doing? But the whole time they've been creating denials for the person's behavior. Mm -hmm. So what I got from that, you're saying the eyes and the mind can deceive you, really. But the body, right. if you learn to feel, won't lie to you. Never. Mm. I like that. It's very true. Like I, that again, you're saying things that I think a lot of people probably listening to this episode will resonate with a lot of what you're saying, right? We'll resonate it with it. We'll say, Oh yes. Okay. Absolutely. But I don't know how to fix that. I don't know how to fix that. You know, there's excuses that come up. Oh, what, what you know, how do I, what do I do? And do they start small? You know, meditation is something people keep telling me that people should be trying to do first. Maybe that's a first Go at Meditation it. Meditation helps you get centered in your body. But again, a lot of people who feel they don't know how to sit and relax enough to get into that state. Mm -hmm. So again, the easiest way to get into that state is to play. Okay. Play. So the one thing that I've heard over and over again throughout my history of doing this, once people really get it, they're always surprised at how simple it really is to heal. <laughs> right we make it complicated it's not complicated be honest and go play mm -hmm. be honest with yourself not anybody else yourself mm -hmm. 
do I really like this person? Do I really like this food? What do I want to do? You know, honest. If somebody asks you to do something, you don't want to do it. You're always saying yes. Well, take your time to, to be different and say, sorry, can't do that. Be surprised how different your body feels. But if you're always saying yes, and then you're not really wanting to do it, there's all this anxiety, frustration, knots in your stomach, hesitation, all you put your body through a lot of things for nothing. Mm -hmm. So, and, so, and when, so when you say go play, you mean. I'm 61 years old. I still skip down the street and sing nursery rhymes. Right. Right. I still swing from trees. I play like a little child, just skip you scream you play you throw rocks you have a good time right right it's so interesting that you say that because so many times i've said you know when you're a kid you're in school they have recess and you go out for recess and you you know i hope that kids are still playing you know either on their phones yeah. half the times anymore but it scares me about that but you know when you're when you're a kid you go out and you play play soccer or you're doing you know whatever yeah. um and then we come out also we get jobs and there's no recess anymore. No. It's it's here's a quick break, throw a sandwich down your stomach, and then go back to work. And wh wh why did we decide to do that? Like, what we should have recess. We should be able to play, you know. So I I agree with what you're saying because we take things so serious, and especially talking to all these people who have NDEs and they've learned who we really are at our core. It's we we're so serious. And then we go, and these people that, you know, they've had these, these, you know, they've had the NDE and they come out and they look at their body and they're like, no, I'm good. <laughs> like in such a quick moment, they're ready to go do what's next. And we spend our whole life with that body being so serious. Yes. And then to just let it go in a second in your spirit body, it says a lot, you know, so we, we need to learn to play. It's, it's important. It, it'll heal at least 60 percent of people's ailments if they just quit worrying about everything and go play on a regular basis i helped a woman um about seven years ago she came to me and she was wearing penny loafers corduroys creased razor sharp a white shirt with a little white sweater and a doily collar she sits down crosses her legs puts her hands on her lap and she looks at me and says i'd like you to tell me what's wrong with me and I looked at her and I laughed and I said, darling, the only thing wrong with you is that stick so shoved so far up your tuchus you can't even breathe. <laughs> she talked to me, she says, look at me, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, look at you, you're a little imp. Somebody put you in a bottle and locked you up, but you need to go scream and play and skip and have a good time. That's the only thing wrong with you. Right. So we talked about how she is worried about what people think when she gets too excited and everything. And it turns out that she had two grandkids. And when she had her grandkids, there was no pain. Mm. So that's because you're out playing. So right. she leaves. I don't hear from her for a while. I was doing a, a speech at a friend's church. This woman walks in with a long tie-dye dress, frizzy hair, and a flower in her hair. And I looked at my wife. I said, do I know her? Well, I said, I don't know. So just before I start speaking, she comes and reaches up, grabs my shoulder, and she says, the stick's not all the way out. I'm working on it. I'll see you soon. And she <laughs> giggles and runs away. Wow. So two weeks later, she comes to see me. Whole different person. I said, what happened to you? She said, well, you know, I was a little upset when I left you the first time. And then, you know, I had my grandkids the next weekend. So we had a good time. And then that Monday morning when they left, I couldn't move. I was in so much pain, and all I heard was your voice saying, pull the stick out. Right. So she said, I got up and started to play, and gradually the pain went away, and over a course of a few weeks, it was gone. So now she takes seniors out once a month to remember their inner child and go play, and she makes a very good living. At it hasn't been sick a day since. She just needed to honor who she was, and she was a little imp. And, you know, there's not a lot of people that have that energy, but the ones that do, mm -hmm. as children, they were told to behave, quit making a fuss, people are watching, so they lock themselves up. And their spirit has been bottled their whole life, as hers was.
Mm -hmm. So for her, that was absolutely the only thing she needed to do was to go play because that was her spirit. And, you know, not everybody has that, just like vivaciousness. Not all women have that. But a lot of the women who do have that tend to lock up that energy and shove it down because they don't like the attention they get from males and other people because of that vivaciousness. Right. So that causes different illnesses. So I have yeah. to teach them that's not meant to be locked up. It doesn't have to be expressed as sex, it, but it has to be expressed. So do something creative, do pottery, do painting, do something you can put that passion in, even mm -hmm. cooking. And once they learn to put that mm, into whatever else they're doing and separate it from the sex, that vitality comes back. Right, because they've been they've been holding that in. It's a piece of who they are. They're not they're not letting it, it out. That's and that's with everything, right? right? If we're if we're right. if a piece of us is being locked away, then we slowly fester and and manifest illnesses. Yes, right. And your and going back to the beginning, your the way that you use the sound and the way that you work through it, it must release or bring the vibration up in people. To you know, because we're talking about energy right now, we're talking about the things of preventative my, stuff. We my be doing. voice, but, my voice know. tends to work like a tuning fork. Right. So, when something's um, locked up, it's just solid and it's not moving. So, what I do is I surround it with a higher vibration, and it's just like an engine <laughs> until you get it to where it can maintain that vibration. It'll start functioning on its own but there's a little bit of coaxing it to come back into its vibration. Wow. So um, that's the easiest way I can explain it. You know, it's amazing. And again, after listening to a few examples of it, I was kind of mesmerized. It's the best word I could use. I almost like a magnetism of mm -hmm. the sound and uh, again, I'm a sound guy, so maybe that helps. I'm all, everything I like to do, like I don't really like to read. I like to listen to audible books or like everything's audio to me. It's always been that way. Maybe that's the music musician in me. But when I heard it, it was almost overwhelming. It was like, like I could feel it, you know, like it's like, a, yeah, so I can, I, I can, I can Everybody, tell anyone out there that wants to listen, you have to check this out because it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. very. I've had encountered very few people that don't feel it. In the beginning, sometimes people are so locked up, they don't feel anything. And it takes a couple of sessions before they actually feel it. Mm -hmm. But 99% of everybody, they feel it immediately. Have you seen people actually have emotional reactions to the sound? and All the time. Yeah. I, I've seen a lot of things. I've even um, had people let go and beat the shit out of me. Because <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> they were holding, you know, having memories of having been a victim and attacked and mm. i was the one that was there and that was safe for them to you know to retaliate right so wow so this is, a, this is real this is a real heavy work you do and we appreciate it, it and this uh is this has been an amazing conversation like i can't uh, you know say enough that when i see people or work with people or talk to people who are doing work for others but you've it seems like you've mastered it in a way that you're doing work for others, but you're also at the same time holding the integrity of yourself that you're you. This is where I think a lot of people get a little bit confused because working for others doesn't mean giving yourself completely over. You know, you can't Correct. lose yourself in it, right? So it's great that you've found that balance. Well, that's the main reason so many healers get burnt out because they're taking responsibility for the people they're assisting instead of holding space and allowing them their own journey. Wow. So if I if I were to take responsibility for everybody that I help, I'd have been done years ago. Yeah. So it's well, that's yeah. And no yeah. matter how much I want somebody to transition or, or to come out of their stuff, I have to have the fortitude to sit there and watch their journey mm -hmm. and guide them. But I can't go in and say, "Here, give me your hand. Let's go." I can't do that. I think over time with the with the uh, the audience out here at Soul Inspired, and I I do believe a lot of people are healers and empaths and all kinds of different things that listen to this show. So I think this will reach 
people that need to be reached. I think this could really help. Even that last thing you just said about not allowing it to, to burn you out the way that you've described through the entire episode here is huge. I, I'm selfishly taking this on myself because I know I'm a healer. I've, I've always felt it. This is what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> Again, I don't know which route, but I'm allowing myself to just it's like I'm allowing myself now to try to just flow into everything instead of always be thinking 10 steps ahead. I That's the way my mind always worked. So now and I'm just... That's the best thing to do. And you never know what's going to cause somebody to heal. Right. Sometimes it's just a simple phrase that they overhear or a picture that they saw that gets them to recognize, oh, I shouldn't be doing this anymore. Right. So everybody's right. I'm not right for everybody. I'm graduate school. I don't... I don't do feel good. If you come to me and you just want to feel good, I'm not going to stay. Right. If, if you come to me and you do your work and you want to heal, I'll do everything I can in my power to support you in that. I also take very few men. I only take males that I know there's a possibility of a man coming out. Mm -hmm. If there's no possibility of a man coming out, it's not worth my effort. Wow. Because they don't want to heal. They don't want to change. They want a mommy. So <laughs> you, you are definitely, yeah, you're definitely real because everything you're saying, I agree with to a point. I feel the, that's probably why you see less men uh, in, you know, trying to heal because there's this um, men seem to be a little, we get stuck a little deeper. We're not allowing our emotions to actually show up. We just kind of hold it in there. And we get taught to ignore them. I mean, growing up, it was be a man, shut it down, don't do that, don't you? Know, so always, you know, be a man. And finally, I looked at my stepfather. So, so what's a man? Right. He couldn't answer me. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. How's yeah. a man supposed to speak? Because I'm very soft spoken. It was always expect you know you should be boisterous. I don't need to be boisterous. Mm -hmm. I've created yeah. enough fear into people in, in certain times of my life to recognize you don't need to be boisterous. Yeah. So, wow. You know, and, and I've experienced a lot of different forms of our existence here. I've been in the drugs, prostitution, you know, all of it I've seen and been around, you know, heroin addicts growing up. So I got to see what we do with our energy and, you know, how we shove our, and the reasons why we do it. And most of us, we just want to be able to feel loved in our journeys into drugs and everything else is because we don't know how to feel. Hmm. And those things allow us to feel in some small way. Yeah. Um, this has been, I mean, we don't know how to feel. I feel like I could, every time we have a little bit of a conversation here, I could go in another direction. But uh, I I really want to thank you for the time today. This has been absolutely amazing. Do people reach out to you through your uh, website? Is that like, how do people get in contact with you if they want to work um, there's with a you? contact form on my website. Um, generally, again, because I work through referral, most people just call me because they were referred. But um, right. my website is divineharmonics.com and I can be reached there. I have an Instagram under Divine Harmonics and a TikTok same same handle and there's a contact form they can fill out and then to get in contact with you correct it's amazing thank you thank so, you so much would you like me to chant real quick before we go i would love that i i didn't know whether that was okay but i'd love to put hear your left hand on your chest and your right hand on your belly my left hand uh, on my chest right hand on your belly so what i do when i chant is i push energy so the hand is where your meridian is, so I can stay on that meridian mm -hmm. when I'm pushing the energy. Um, I do tend to put people through detoxes, so I'm going to try and keep it short enough that I don't do that. I'm on call 24 hours a day in case I do, so people call me 2, 3 in the morning when they're going through their stuff, and 5 or 10 minutes, I get them through it. So um, this does cause things to move, whether you believe it or not. So, so take a deep breath in through your belly and straight out. Here we go. Mm hmm.
Just a little bit. Wow. I can feel that. Um, the uh, Zoom, unfortunately, does cut out a lot of it. And so I'd like to encourage people to go listen to your chants as well. And I might be able to overdub one right into the uh, episode so I can really get people to hear it. So if you have a if you have one that um, you've put out, I if, if I can get your permission to use it, I can put it in over top too. Absolutely. You can go over to the SoundCloud and choose any one you want. Wow. Do they all resonate the same way, like going through the different notes they resonate that you use? Differently. Some of them I get extremely high frequencies. Um, some of them very low. It really depends on, you know, where the blockages are and what needs to be done to move the energy. So again, this, I have no idea what I'm doing. I've done this my whole life. I have no control over the chance. It's whatever you need comes through. So wow. um, I don't even have a choice in how long it goes. So um, the longest I've chanted is two and a half hours straight. And I tried to stop. It just kept coming. There's like a drive, like a feeling yeah. of keep going, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the shortest is about three minutes. But on average, I spend 10 to 15 minutes with my clients at a time. And I break up my sessions sometimes over two or three days to avoid the detoxes. Again, as a musician, I do want to just say that when you say you, you don't know how you do it, it just you've had it your whole life, that kind of thing. That's how I feel about my writing. And I don't always relate to many people that way. It it's just a natural thing that just happens. Um, and so uh, I can relate to it. It's just the way you say it. So if there's any musicians out there, singers or any, anybody that it could even be painters that, you know, some people just take a paint brush to a canvas and they don't even know what they're doing. The next thing you know, there's this beautiful art. It's, it's who we are at our core. Everything comes out from somewhere. And I think right. that's the state we should be in, you know, using our it creativity. Is. Yeah. A perpetual state of innocence. Right. Remember, I like to be a toddler and life is golden. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's probably why I keep surrounding myself with, you know, younger people because I'm always trying to keep that going, you know. And yeah. uh, having a toddler myself, uh, she keeps me on my toes and you have to keep keep that innocence going. So I've loved this. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah. I Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I, I generally turn to the audience and say, please continue to like, share, and subscribe. Get the soul-inspired message out there so I can keep having amazing people come on and talk to us like Emmanuel who can help heal the world. We're all trying to get to the same place. So thank you so much, Emmanuel, for being here today. I really appreciate your time. You're